All right, we're going to try that again. Everything should be good now. Um, hey, brother. Hey. We all set? Yeah, the patch doesn't load yeah. unless you restart the computer. So <clears throat> I forgot to cool. do that after the interview with Sammy Gravano. All right, welcome back. So we're going to be talking with Arthur Kwan Lee, one of the uh, key artists of our day, artist of the year, artist of all time. He won the internet's greatest artist ever of all time. I'm just joking. I forget what the exact I, I, what, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> what was the exact award? So there's a residency internationally, you know, called the Eileen Kaminsky Family Foundation, and they have a residency program that's like really respected. And uh, basically, they gave me Artist of the Year in 2020. So for New York City, I was basically that guy. So I was I was awesome. that nigga. But yeah, so basically, what happened as it unfolded though is that, um, you know, I was basically kicked out for at that time. I was like. In, in the closet about my support for Trump. But then when the pandemic hit around, I was also like, obviously, I'm against all that. So, um, you know, but this story has been shared across the board with a lot of your following, you know, a lot of people who are in the culture space, but people who also aren't. It's just like, you got to blend in with social camouflage because this, this degeneracy is just widespread now. And I would say, especially the art industry. Yeah, I've, I've met a few people and done some interviews with people um, in that domain, and they talk about it being pretty bad. I mean, I met a, a woman one time, and she was saying that in the high art world, a lot of the women that she met, like, they were literally into, like, you know, like, demonic sorcery, magic, that kind of stuff, trying to channel that energy into the, the high art world. Um, would you say that you encountered any of that, or is that is that far-fetched? I got my foot into the door to be in the position to be vetted, to start being invited to certain circles of that sort. So let me explain that. When you look at like mainstream media stars, like Little Nas X, Sam Smith, Madonna, Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, all these people, like, you know, you know, we the, the metric for success in that in that space is like how many followers they have, how much money and how what the concerts they can do when they're on TV. But those people, they have their own celebrities, like the rock stars, rock stars are all in their art world. So you look at painters like Kim Noble, you look at Marina Abramovich, obviously, you look at all of these people, they are sort of the, like, they're the ones that are venerated and worshipped at these parties, right? So I never got to get too close to that <laughs> because I keep, simply couldn't keep up with the Joneses. But um, I sort of look at myself as like the anti-Marina Abramovich because so my goal in my paintings is to revitalize Christian imagery. That has been my goal. I felt I became a painter because I was a Christian first. But, you know, those values don't line up. Like, too many people fall in love with art because of the art historical imagery. You look at all the greatest works is always produced by Christians. Yeah. So they fall in love with art because the Christian imagery, but then the industry has become so, um, it's, it's become this channel of, of collectivism and, and the dark one. Yeah, I, I saw an interview one time, that, or a, excuse me, a documentary one time. It was really good too, <clears throat> tying the art world into that. It's actually a cover for a lot of money laundering. Have you seen any of that? It absolutely is. If, if you guys look at the art industry itself, um, there's only five galleries that are at the top of the pyramid. So it's Marion Goodman Gallery, Hauser and Worth, Pace Gallery, David Zorner, and Gagosian. Like, how is it that five galleries run the entire sphere? Well, it's because it's a financial instrument. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The same reason why Hunter Biden right now is having all this talk about his art dealer, George Berger. You yeah. got to understand, like, George Berger has a lot of connections to Russia and China. And how does a guy who's been... Hunter was trying to get shows for, like, three years, yeah. and nobody would take his art seriously. But then George signs him because he realizes that this is an, uh, this is a golden ticket for him, right? The moment his dad gets, in, gets into office, so... The art world is not even about art anymore. And it's a shame because art is supposed to be for everyone. And it's supposed to be like spiritual servitude in a way. Like I know right. I'm a servant. Like I'm very aware of what my role is in life. My my role is to is to bring people to God with beauty. Like I know that's my role to serve. But like artists today are all about like <laughs> basically vanity and degeneracy. And, and, self and it, 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 it will 100 percent so so you know um it's it's pretty um it's pretty bad in the, the the deeper you go into the world the more unapologetic they are about their their lasciviousness what i'll say yeah i remember too 
uh, looking at um, Ayn Rand. I'm not a huge fan of Ayn Rand, but she actually had a good book <clears throat> on uh, aesthetics and art theory. And she was really just reflecting like medieval and Aristotelian ideas of uh, how art should function. And she was talking about how one of the things that happened in the 20th century was a shift to uh, what she called emotivism. And that basically no longer was art um, about the transcendent or about harmony, symmetry, beauty, beauty, form, order. It was about actually becoming um, dissonant and good art was identified with feeling did it did it elicit emotion and feeling in you now there's nothing wrong with uh, emotion and feeling but something gross can elicit emotion and feeling so we wouldn't we wouldn't say that just because it elicits strong feeling it's therefore quote good art and that's how we got down this track of i mean as well as like the cia being involved in the arts and stuff that's how we got down this track of thinking that you know, uh, a, a crucifix in a jar of urine is art, right? Or cows chopped up into a bunch of chunks, Damien Hurst type stuff is art. Do you have any comments on like that really crazy level of like how it's gotten so gross? Well, what, what I'll say is there's a guy named Tom Wolf, and he wrote, he's an American cultural critic. Yeah. And he wrote, he wrote a book called A Painted Word. And, and in this book, he basically talked about how inevitably what's going to happen with the art industry, it's going to be utilized as an instrument for the radical left. And, oh. and he didn't necessarily point to the Frankfurt School, but he predicted that those kind of organizations would utilize it yeah. because there's like um, there's a subjectivity in the art world where it allows you to sort of dissolve boundaries. And you got to understand, like, the purpose of art is normalizing values. Like, that's what the function of art is. So basically... If you get to put up this relative horse manure up on a wall and you can call it like um Yeah, I'm sorry, my connection's being weird, so I'm I'm moving to a different room. I apologize. It's okay, yeah. Um yeah. another thing too made me think of the uh <laughs> is it Jamie, is it true lies where there's like a a cover uh, of art, like the they're using art for. Yeah, like I think it's True Lies where they're using the art world as a a, a cover for, like black ops and and espionage and weapons trafficking and stuff like that. So, I mean, I think this whole art world is like completely corrupt, and I don't even know it that well. I don't know that much about it, but every time I talk to somebody like you or, or from that world, they're like, oh, yeah, you're totally right. Oh, yeah, it's totally that way. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, let me, let me try this again. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. That's all right. Okay. Apologies, okay. people. <laughs> so, so, I mean, what I'll say is that, like, um, I had a show in Art Basel, Miami, okay? Uh, and, and Art Basel's kind of like a big deal to, sh to exhibit there. And the work I was showing, I was showing like, you know, Christianity killing paganism, that, that kind of imagery, and it was captivating. But there's a show called Scope, S-C-O-P-E, Scope Show in Miami. And that same festival that I was showing at, there was a banana duct taped to a wall. That was sold for $150,000. <laughs> right? And you got to understand, like, every one of your audience members has seen, like, work on the wall. It's like, why the fuck is this worth anything? You know what I mean? Like, like what am I looking at? Like, right. how are you charging what you charge? Well, it's being utilized as a financial instrument. That's what's yes. happening. Right? It's because because if, you, if you take it seriously as an aesthetic critique, it's an insult to your intelligence. Sure. It's, it, it's, it's bullshit, right? So... I remember like witnessing these these moments where I'm like, it's either a gateway, a gateway drug for like darkness or it's like bullshit art. And then I came to realize that that's what it is. It's a club and it's a very dark club. And it's also a, an instrument to either write off taxes or money launder. Because exactly. all donations are tax deductible. Yeah, people are like trying to figure out why does anybody care about a bunch of JPEGs, NFTs? That's to move and hide money dummy <laughs> what, what do you think that 100 yeah it's, it's and it's the same in the, the yeah art. i mean there's two things that are unregulated in the world especially in new york city right which is no coincidence that that's the epicenter of both diamonds and fine art diamonds and art the price is subjective you get to determine that based on whoever controls it 
So those five essentially control it, you know, and, and I was never really invited to that club, but I got, I flew pretty close to the sun, we'll call it. I got invited to the Diamond. I got invited to the Diamonds and Pearl Club uh, with Prince and Rosie Gaines. You know what I'm talking about? D to the I to the A to the M. There you go. There you o go. O to the so, N. So, something like that. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, but yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that the man, 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 you're, you're like you're like Usher. No, it's called Usher. It's Usher. <laughs> it's pronounced Usher. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's my bro. I wore this shirt for you, by the way. I know. I like it. I, I approve. You get a thumbs up. By the <laughs> way, for those that are interested, um, our buddy here, he sent us this amazing painting of Sir from Ro Father Sir from Rose. So, uh, really, really cool. We love it. We have it up here in the in the in the room. I want to put it back here, but then it's like, it doesn't really fit on the shelf. So I'm going to have to figure out where I can put it up where everybody can see it, but really amazing work. Um, you have a very Thanks, unique bro. style. I think that, um, in my experience, I have, I have buddies that are really good, you know, professional artists and it, in my experience, like it took him a long time, my good buddy to like find his own style. So let's go over into the art stuff, like the, your, sure. your work, like, what did you do to like, who was your influences and then what, how long did it take you before you developed your own unique style? So, so the first thing is, is uh, we can talk about the art, but by talking about aesthetics and art, the fact that you're also talking about culture, right? So what, what, I'll, what I'll first say is that my, um, you know, the, the, the traditional belief when it comes to art training and, um, Oh yeah, you're there. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, like like all 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 art training traditionally is that you have to learn the rules to break the rules, right? So you need. To, so I've had this young man. He sent me a DM. He goes, "Hey, I want to paint this reoccurring dream I have, and Saint Michael is in is in it as well." I'm like, "Okay, beautiful." I'm like, "I need you to first draw a bowl of fruit perfectly." <laughs> you know what I mean? You need to first learn proportion, mm -hmm. rendering, color. So what I will say is that you know I was taught traditionally, so I learned how to render very accurately. I, I learned how to do perspective, all, all, all the stuff that you need to have. And once I developed that style, I, I had an attraction to some of the European impressionists. Um, I love the uh, the color palette of the abstract expressionists, although a lot of abstract expressionists are believing yeah. liberals. But but, but what, what I will say is that um, there's formalism and there's contextualism, right? Formalism is your ability to utilize color theory, uh, compositional awareness, actual lines and form and technique in the material. Contextualism is the subject at hand. What do you like to dive into? And I was always into symbolism. And at a young age, I was always into masculine imagery. And, and I often thought about why am I like, why am I known for painting masculinity and Christianity? And why are people decoupling it? Well, that itself says something about the culture. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. So for me, it's like, I love painting like honorable, strong, masculine, like bears of light, you know? And often I do so by painting Christian imagery, but um, that's kind of what I'm known for now. But but that's that's the kind of subject matter that I like to dive into. And, and in the painting I gave you, it's it's a um it's a part of a series called Blood and Fire. And and then the whole mission of that is to try to spread like positive masculinity. And the reason why I'm into this masculine, like masculinity and Christianity, those are my two subjects. And the reason for that is because everything is fucked up, Jay. <laughs> Everything's fucked up because we we no longer have like traditional wholesome masculinity as our North Star. That that that's that's just my belief, you know. Absolutely, yeah, at all. Uh, that's why I like painting that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it all goes back to the intentional destruction of the masculine archetype in all forms. And that, that's been like a hundred year plus war against archetypes, war against particularly the archetype of the father and then the war against what a woman is. That, that you have to wage the war, I figured out, at the level of archetypes constantly, consistently to get us to this cr level of craziness. Yeah. And now it's bleeding over into biology, right? So now it's like actually just literally attacking the biology of man and woman. So it's getting it's getting totally uh, insane and apocalyptic. But yeah, I really like that you're uh, stressing basically logos in art. Um, 
how did you come to notice that that was what was going on? Like, what are the things that keyed you into that? Because not, not a lot of people in the art world, especially figure that out. They're like going further and further in the other direction. Like I remember uh, I went to art show when my, my buddy that I was talking about, he did his senior project, senior show. And it was like him and three or four other artists at the university. And the other artists were like these chicks that were basically putting up their uh, panties on the wall. And it's like, putting up, uh, you know, blood-stained um, um, tamp tampons hanging from the wall and shit, literally, right? It's like, he he's over there doing, like, actual, like yeah. you said, like, traditionally taught, like, awesome art, and they're putting up basically their <laughs> filth. Um, so it's like, very few people are, are seeing that. How did you see that? Well, well I'll, I want to first um, say I'm glad you said... I'm glad you also mentioned the feminine because I think the like I I just want to share this because I look at like a lot of like the reason why red pill podcasts and red pill movers are so known today, like why Andrew Tate is so known today, like all these individuals, it's because they're making a correct diagnosis on the culture because there is an absence of that that you know if we're gonna be honest, it's gonna be fathers, but right. but there is absence of like the the the, the protecting and providing role of, of men you know doing what is right that is gone today but often the solution to me is just as fucking ugly like there's this weird there's this weird masculine frame today of cop like i don't believe it's like the negation of femininity is a solution i think uh yielding masculinity properly and honorably i think that's the solution personally but i'm I talking about art history there also so all the images are always that way but th that that's my personal belief but you know, I think artists are always re responding to the culture, Jay. Mm -hmm. And with me, it's uh, I became an artist. I, I thought about this. I'm like, why did I even get into art as a young man in the first place? And it's because I didn't like government schooling. Because government schooling, like you talk about, is possessed by that matriarchal spirit. And I, I believe that we are living in, we are living under a matriarchy. It's funny that the feminists always project what's actually going on the opposite end. Like, they talk about patriarchy, but we actually live in a matriarchy. And I think what sealed the deal for me also is that because I was already painting like warriors, like, and it was kind of new agey. I'm sorry to sound beta, but it was kind of new agey sometimes. Like I'll be painting like Musashi and then like, you know, just general like masculine figures. And then I think when the pandemic hit, that's when I realized like, I'm going to stop like apologizing for being a fucking Christian. <laughs> that's kind of like, I kind of got to that point because I had to hide being a Christian when I was in the art world. I had to, I had to not show, like, I had a one of the gallery directors in the Lower East Side told me not to wear my chain with a cross on it. And I was like, okay, I got to be careful because this offends people, mm. right? So mm. I got to this point where I'm like, you know what? I, I don't care anymore because I, I think everyone talks about the abusive high chair tyrant, like the drunken dad, that dark fatherly archetype. I, I, okay, sure. There's a wise king and then there's that shadow, sure. But nobody talks about the feminine dark archetype. Which is yep. like the overprotective mother. Which is ironic and, and too. Was, Go ahead. But, but that's what I'm saying. When I was when I was in New York City, I'm seeing the mask mandates, the 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 vaccine requirement. This is all under the guise of "Mommy loves you" is for your protection. And I believe we're possessed by that spirit today. Every time, yep. every time the collectivists attack us, it's under that, that guise. It's because I care about you. I want to do the best for you. It's, it's out of love. It's for your protection. And I realized right there, I'm like. This is exactly how the gallery started talking to me about why I shouldn't paint Christian art. <laughs> yeah. So every, <laughs> and I was like, it sounds like the same shit. When you have the rise of egalitarianism, equalitarianism, uh, which are themselves kind of typically feminine traits and characteristics, what you have is a society that wants to base everything around fairness, base everything around emotivism again. So the art world becomes dominated by uh, emotivism and not, objective form geometry structure etc becomes dominated by the feelings and when everything is based around feelings now the new ethic or moral is if you hurt my feelings that makes you bad and that's what's actually now evil or bad is the uh, the feeling effect of events not whether something's objectively bad or good or whether something objectively in symmetry form and harmony in the art it's it's all about emotivism again and those are again feminine traits not that emotions are inherently bad but you can't have a society or a or a, a domain like the arts or education or business dominated by feelings 
And even beyond that, it's like, it's, it's, it's not even about the feelings. It's literally a control structure. It's a control mechanism. It has nothing to do with actually making everybody safer and feel better. It's totally a control structure. It's, 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 it's an oppressive spiritual control structure. And so what you're talking about is uh, ideally what, I mean, if you want to have a real revolution in the arts, it would be to do uh, actually beautiful art against the all the ugly art that's out there. I mean, I, you drive through cities, dude, and it's like they put... They put up the most uh, bizarre, just like deformed things. And people don't know that all of that deformed art literally comes out of uh, weaponized psychological warfare in the Cold War. 100%. 100%. It's, 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 a, it's a complete cult of ugliness. And I think what I'll say is this. What I've noticed essentially, of course, it's never this blatant, but it's useful to look at it from, from this terminology is it's always like it's always a matter of first of all the aesthetic fight is always it's really you look at art history it's like always like the men of god trying to make the art point upwards you know and i call that universal standards yeah the transcendence and then, right 100 percent art should point upwards and then and then on the other side it's basically art being produced after everyone's demoralized and it's in, in a way yeah. it's like an arm of the state at that point so it becomes like propaganda almost. Oh, it is. And, and, and I, I believe that the opposite of high art is prop is like this. Well, today it's like this leftist propaganda. Because when you go to the galleries right now, like today, Jay, if you right now go to check out some of these galleries in Manhattan, like what do they do? It's all this, it's all rainbow art. It's all it's all gender bending art. They're the ones yeah. who are like worshipped and put it into the limelight. So I think all of these galleries are now basically propaganda branches oh absolutely and but it's the same yeah. with it's the same with museums too i know museums is a different domain than than art but a lot of times the art world actually does kind of overlap with uh the museum world and uh for example in nashville the frisk museum often will house and do a lot of art shows and i've gone to a bunch of those um and and like even 15 20 years ago they would actually have some cool exhibits where they would bring in like medieval and Byzantine art. That was awesome. They did they did an amazing medieval ex exhibition at the Frist in Nashville many years ago. And now it's like the most just awful stuff. I mean, it's just all like, and there's this weird idea that everything indigenous is somehow inherently better. Uh, why? Says who? <laughs> like, we'll just be, and, I mean, the way you define indigenous too, like literally everything could be could fit under the category of indigenous. By the way, so it's just it's just weird, it's and it's because, all it's because they hate white people, and it's because white yeah. men are the ones who hold a cross closest to their heart right now. You know, <laughs> it's like it's crazy shit. Yeah, so basically, it's just uh, like it's just demonic. <laughs> I mean, that's what it amounts it to. Demonic. Now, um, here's something I've been thinking about. I want to see what your opinion on this is. So. Uh, I don't know about now because I haven't really paid attention to art stuff in, in many years. Um, but back in like the 2000s, 2010s, I used to to go to remember when there was remember when magazines were more prevalent even in the 2000s, and and you go to like a bookstore and you would see like giant magazine racks, right? And sometimes those magazine racks would have a lot of avant garde art. They would have a lot of um, magazines basically just dedicated to to different art shows and this kind of stuff. And I used to look through those all the time. Uh, again, because I had a lot of buddies that were that went to art school and they were majoring in in, uh, in that at, at, even at a grad level, and I would notice a weird trend. It may still be the case with a lot of maybe surrealist artists, but I noticed a lot of trends in the two thousands of already the the popular art at that time, even though it was maybe aesthetically pleasing and formally well done. There was a lot of just literate people were painting demons, like literally painting. Um, either what they would be inspired to paint on their drug trips or what they were uh, dreaming about at night or what, like you talk about your buddy that wanted to paint from the dreams, um, recurring dreams. But I've always felt like uh, there is a spiritual realm. There's a, a noetic realm, a mental realm. The uh, influences that we receive, I believe, come out of that realm and they might influence us in the day. They might influence us in our dreams. It might be through people doing drug trips. But then people are painting these influences that come from that realm and so i i feel like the more a society gets like possessed and the more they become demonic you will see it in the spirit of the art that that society puts out i don't know if you have thought about that or felt that way i would agree because you look at 
um, outside of the gallery model, outside of people who have mainstream secular gallery success, who like the independent artists who end up always coming to the top, they're always, um, you know, I use the word spiritual because it's vague. Do you want to be specific about your words? Because you can be some college chick who's into astrology and be spiritual, right? But they're always spiritual artists. And I say this because, you know, for example, like like the hottest thing independently, like the, the people are voting him as like a hot artist was Alex Gray. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Yeah, Alex a good example. A perfect example of this, right? But what I mean, it, and it's um this idea of channeling. In many ways, yeah, artists are channelers. But yeah. what I will say is that um, it's it's seems to I mean it's pretty much a cha- it's channeling for demons today. <laughs> That's what I just you, see you agree with that. Us. I mean it's it's not even um it's not even a secret. You know, you look at like Kim Noble or you look you look at like Maggie Gearlings. Like these are like artists who get like huge funding and do like world tours, and it's it's blatant transhumanism or pedophilic imagery. It's like so obvious. Yeah. <laughs> it's like what about uh, what about Damien Hurst? What do you think of that guy's stuff? I always thought that stuff was pretty. Well, crazy. I mean, I mean, again, it's it's all a cult of ugliness. Like like Damien Hurst's thing is all about like showing off flexing vanity. So his whole thing is like like a diamond encrusted with skulls, right. or he'll uh, he'll hire hunters to get extinct butterflies and make a mandala, which they kind of look pretty. But his whole thing is shock value, shock value, shock value. But as Roger Scruton says, when a culture praises art that's focused on shock value. It just yes. shows that, like, it shows how damaged their psyche is. Right. You know, and, and, and I'll tell you, just working in their art world, like, it, it fucked me up. Just working in their art world as a person who was raised traditionally as a Christian, just trying to deal with these these degenerate people, just because you have to keep your mouth shut in front of them. You know what I mean? So, um, it, it's 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 dark because you know, I what I what I've noticed with fine art is fine art is either a beautiful thing it's either a distillation of the people coming together and recognizing christendom or on the other end it's like it's reverse engineering christianity where they're literally using like art gallery parties as a chance for dark people to get together and shamelessly show their real nature oh, it's, so it's, it's like, it's really, like an it's, alternate community basically right like a like the church, like the church is a community yeah i mean like i'll put the cat out of the bag if any of y'all are in new york you want to see some of this Go to the Norwood Club on Thursday evenings. Go to the Jane Hotel rooftop bar. Like these are places that it's like, oh, there's like high left elites hanging out with like big artists. <laughs> yeah, like- I, th- I think people sense this and we all kind of know this because of, you know, M- Marina Abramovich is hanging out with Jay-Z and Beyonce and Lady Gaga. And the Ross Charles, yeah, all- they're, yeah, they're all hanging out doing these uh, events and the spirit cooking and all this stuff. And um I think a lot of people are like, you know, what is what's what is this? Well, um, my guess would be they're they're in the same covens. I mean, basically, Lady Gaga, you know, they, they treat Marina Abramovich like she's some kind of witch master, right? She she's uh she's the center of the room at any time she comes into these events, you know. What what in your view do you th- think is the reason that she's so? Uh, by the way, I remember reading somewhere. I didn't. This kind of surprised me, although it shouldn't that she had some kind of like a uh, state department clearance. So Marina Bramovich actually kind of has some kind of state department government connection. I mean, it doesn't, it shouldn't surprise me. I, I heard about that. So I don't know the details, but I have heard that. And I know that she has like her collectors again, th- th- they're, they're ultimately hiding this by saying art is subjective. Just keep that in mind always. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying about the emotivism. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but I don't know. I, I know that rumor, but I know some of her collectors like, her collectors are movers and shakers like that. that that's, that's all it boils down to. Um, and, and her art, listen, uh, I, I'm obviously I'm going to show my bias that I'm an artist, but the aesthetics always tell you everything. They tell you the whole narrative and look at her art, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's tied into the very message, what she's doing. And um, it's very clear that, these people, they. I look mean, at, it's, it's she sees it as a ritual working, right? right? I mean, isn't that obviously what it is? It's it's Satanism. She's a literal Satanist witch. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Um, yeah, but and she doesn't even hide it. 
No, I mean, so I'm saying she in that Reddit AMA that was uh, famous, like she explained that, yeah, it's, it's an intentional ritual magic working. Yeah, it's, it's not unlike the, you know, like everybody knows about the Thule Society because of the occultic background of it. But it's not unlike that because all, I don't think people understand that there was, a, you know, it was also like a, a network for financial and political elite to, to also congregate with world class talent. Because when you look at some of the members of Thule, you know, Dietrich Eckhart, he's uh, like a huge poem at that time. You look at uh, Richard Wagner, he was in, like, that's how Hitler got to meet his childhood hero. Like, it's, it's, look, these people, they're going to have so much influence. Of course, they're going to create their own talent and put it out there. You know what I'm saying? Like, think of the amount of power these people have. Like, you're not just going to let anyone just get big. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, absolutely. That's why the arts have to be completely, totally controlled. Uh, 100%. It's, it's yeah. absolutely controlled. You know, I, actually, while we're talking about the Thule, like, you look at how, you know, it's, it's, it's actually genius. It's actually genius what they did. It's genius social engineering. You know, they would, um, in 1937, there was a degenerate art exhibition. Right. And literally what they did is they showed all the cultural traders of Germany. Right. Now, that's already interesting to dedicate all this funding to do it like pop, like uh, a tour style of fine art exhibitions to proselytize their values. That's already smart. But what they did also is there's a guy named William Joyce and William Joyce, his comedic name was Lord Haha. OK, so look at him like like a Bill Burr today. Or okay. Dave Chappelle, like a big comedian, okay? So Joseph Goebbels discovered through dual connections, because you know they're so connected, right? He discovered that he was uh, he's he was a um he had a radio show in Ireland, and he was a fascist who had this Marxist ideal, but he discovered he secretly felt this way, so he hired him. So the Nazis funded this man to be like an arm for um, disseminating their values under disguise. It's like it's almost like what these late night talk show comedians do, right? Interesting. So it's it's really it's really smart, but it's like the bottom line is that like you go up high into the art world, it's all controlled, and you are either aligned with their values or you're compromised. <laughs> it's, it's one or the other, you know. Yeah, it reminds me of um, the in the modern world, the real pioneers of this, and this this was actually predates Frankfurt School, pre predates what you're talking about. The if you read the the Johann Ratio book on the history of the Fabians in the 1890s, they were already doing degenerate art exhibits to change the morals of Britain, and so that included things like bestiality um, as public art displays, and it shocked everybody. But that shock. Uh, effect was intentional that was part of the the brutalism right or the uh debasing of the society which the fabians were real pioneers of doing then you get in the 30s what uh, examples of what you're talking about 20s and 30s then you get frankfurt school in the 40s and 50s uh beginning to do this uh together with the oss and the cia to quote fight the uh tiny mustache man and then the cultural uh congress for cultural freedom continues all of that into the cold war with their front operation, which funds uh, Warhol and um, uh, Jackson Pollock and all those right. goof goofballs. So, yeah, I, I, it's amazing that people don't pick up on it because when you hear it, like what you just talked about, I never thought about the Thule Society being an example of that because I didn't know that much about that. But that makes perfect. Absolutely. It's like, oh, yeah, of course, that's what it is. Yeah. Just like just like when you hear that, it's like, oh, this is a front for money laundering. Oh, duh. Of course, that's what it is. They're not buying a hundred thousand. It's, it's almost like, you know, it's like it's so obvious that we miss it. And that we miss it. It's, it's hidden it's, in plain sight. Yeah, it's like 100 100 percent. And, you know, it's like it's, it's pretty dark. man. It, it, it makes you really think about how like it's all controlled social engineering. And of course, they're going to utilize their, their creative class. You know, well, yeah, and Tavistock spent so many years studying as well. I mean, Frankfurt School actually had a lot of members uh, between them and Tavistock working on both institutes. And Tavistock set up all these satellites in the United States, like uh, they, had a, they had a giant building at University of Michigan, which is dedicated to culture studies and culture warfare. And I'm so, I'm so glad to hear um, somebody from the art world like you understanding that um, the power structure. It's not just social engineering. I mean, it's literally culture creation and culture steering and that, and that they will toxify culture on purpose in a scientific way. Now, we know that ultimately it's spiritual and it's demonic. I mean, they're deluded and, and they're part of this uh, system. So they actually think that, uh, 
I mean, I'm talking about the Taoist type people. They just think it's science. Oh, it's science, and that we have to do this to control and steer society. And uh, no, they don't even realize that they're themselves subservient to uh, a demonic delusion. But man, it's just really great to hear people from the art world um, um, getting into this. Now, tell us if you would. I know every. I know you've you've probably told the story a million times, but a lot of people in my audience don't know it. So, what happened with the counts, the canceling, and the? Uh, I think it was about you talked about BLM and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 um, um, yeah. So, I, I so again, I, I went to this residency program. It's, it's really respected, and, and that gave me a lot of clout in the art world. So, they, I started to get multiple solo exhibitions. I was signed with actually six decent art galleries, not at the top, but like pretty good. So, I was able to get shows regularly, and, and, it, and it was kind of a high, man, because I'm just like, I get to just be in my studio, just make art. They come pick it up. They sell it, take 50%. That's fine. I get to keep working. It was a beautiful thing. So it was it was a nice high to have, but you, people don't understand that when you're working in the art world, you hang out with your dealers like, like multiple times a week for a long time. You get dinner, you connect, like you're facilitating sales with them, right? So you constantly have to hang with these people. And, you know, like bottom line is it's just become a really woke sphere. And um, this is a pretty funny story. Um, one of the galleries, she was she had six artists signed, and I was one of them. And we go to this wood fire oven pizza place, and it's it's you know it's because it, it, people will often be like, "What's the thing that caused it?" And I can't ever pinpoint it because it's like it's like a death from like a, you know it's almost like uh you know when somebody asks why did you guys get divorced, they can't say one thing. It's like betaization from like a thousand concessions, you know what I mean? So I have like a bunch of these little stories where I just kept burning the bridge because like the art world's really small and. Uh, that that story is funny because at this point, um, that month was Stop Asian Hate Month. So I was like, OK, OK, you know, like like um, whatever. But she brings it up and she goes, listen, Arthur, I'm thinking you collaborate with our BLM advocate artist. So Stop Asian Hate it's BLM <laughs> art. This is crazy. It's like token. It, like I'm a total token right there. Sitting there feeling like, <laughs> why am I here? Right. And at that point, like, this is me not thinking about financial security or anything, Jay. This is me just realizing, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to, we'll see what happens. I'll let go and let God. Fuck it. You know? Because it, it, it was, just, you know, kind of ballsy. Um, and I, I look at her dead in the eyes and I just say, uh, she goes, what do you think about that? You know, we do this collaborative show. And I said, well, I think uh, BLM is a modern blackface where white liberals like you utilize a black identity to push their liberal agenda. <laughs> and, and the whole sick all burn, air, bro. Sick burn. Sick burn. <laughs> all the air in the room just like disappeared. And, and, and it was just so awkward. And, and then um, and then she goes, Well, what do you, you know, and she and then the, the black chick, she goes like you, she says all this shit to me. And and uh, what did I say? Oh, and, and I responded to her by saying, like, I think it's really odd that blacks assaulting Asians specifically based on race is white supremacy. <laughs> <laughs> and and I just, I just kept saying these things. And eventually I realized this gallery is done. And I had another story with this woman who worked for a good gallery, one of the directors, these key things kept happening. And essentially I was just ghosted. Like I, I nobody ever answered to me. And I realized I was like, okay, I just got, you know, you don't get a letter. They just say, screw this guy, you know, but I was getting to the point. Like I was literally being taken out for dinner and sushi with George Berger. Like George Berger is the guy who's laundering for Hunter Biden right now. Like he was taking me out for dinner and all this shit. And I just was like, yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I might, I've always been this guy who's going to speak his mind, but I did learn an important lesson, Jay. And it, it says a lot about human nature. I learned that, you know, cause I often wondered why people don't speak up and stand up for what's right, and why it's so hard to make, you know, being honorable and, and, and speaking this truth to power, why is it so hard to do this in the mainstream? And I realized right there, I realized that, you know, it's, it's one thing to be hated, but it's another to be hated and poor. And I, that's what I realized, because I lost all my sources of income, and I had to start over. And when I look at, when I think about people who are not in the cultural front, like you and I, people who are in an office and some lady in a cubicle saying you need to take the vaccine you need, and you need to take pronoun training with the, with your other, with the other employees. It's like, you want to tell her to go fuck herself, but 
she he's also thinking about feeding his kids and not having an income oh yeah no i mean weaponizing the uh your paycheck basically like uh that's and that's ultimately what all of this is going towards with all the tech social uh credit score that's that's where they want to go because they know that most people are not going to resist it out of fear of losing the paycheck so you're 100 percent right yeah that's that's yes yes So, so that's 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 like so for me it's been a spiritual war you know because like I literally walked away from, frankly, man, I walked away from a lot of money, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because it's just like, I can't, I can't keep spending my time with these, these degenerate narcissists, you know, I just can't have it. So um, that's, that's the long story short version of, of basically me just sticking my middle finger to the fine art world. Bro, why, why, look, dude, why don't you just, I, look, why don't you just do an exhibit, uh, tape a banana to the wall. Okay. Sell that for 140,000. Then the next exhibit, tape two bananas to the wall pay, and charge two eighty for that one. Then do three. Do just keep compounding it. Problem <laughs> solved, dude. I, I need to first have uh, some of that dark money wanting to launder with me. But <laughs> if you know any good, if you know any good money, who wants to write off taxes? Because I'm gonna. I know taxes. some of that good dark money that's ready to pay for a, for a full fleet of bananas. On a, on a wall oh man and, uh, i wanted to mention something you mentioned yeah. the frankfurt school did you know the frankfurt school was the one who created art colleges no i did not so so when you when you look at like art education before art universities were born they were atelier based right like anything else you're gonna be a plumber you're gonna study under a plumber apprentice right and, and think about it, like art education that, you don't that have I to notice yeah, like, that, that i did know but i didn't know, yeah yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's it's like think about like like if you want to go to college to learn a system, okay, fine. But it's like I believe in art education. Don't get me wrong. But art education today, it's all social theory. It's all like right. basically leftist programming, and, and it and they started off like that too. It wasn't like you know they transitioned. They started off that way because there's a guy named John Murphy in the Frankfurt School, and he wrote a paper called Art in the Social World, and he specifically writes. <laughs> from the own words and he wants to make art he, like artists should be utilized to to for uh uh to spread like yeah co- like collective like cultural collectivism yeah that was his that was his goal it wasn't even like so he literally was cognizant that we should transition from artists wanting to make art that points towards something holy to artists should be utilized as an arm of the state they're like activists he, he was this, very this is, clear with that this is what people don't understand is that, and it's not just the art world, basically in all of the domains of the social order, people have gone to the university to be brainwashed into being activists in whatever field. So women go into the legal field to be activists for social justice in the legal field. They go into HR to be activists for social justice and human resources in the corporate world. They go into the art world to be an activist change agent. They're called change agents. This is absolutely real. And the people at the level that uh, Arthur's talking about, I mean, they're all just a bunch of low-level dummies. They don't really know that it's a top-down thing, but it is absolutely a top-down thing because money comes from the foundations and from these really super rich people into what he's talking about, these art schools and the universities as well. My buddy went to a state university and he was always butting heads with the uh, art professors there because even though he did get a good education, he did get a good education and did get a, a, a loosely, I guess you could say a classical traditional training. Um, they were all just tr- totally trying to brainwash him into like, Oh, you need to uh, be drawing more dead carcasses, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, yeah. You, you know, what, what is the term useful idiots? They're apt. They, they come yeah. out of college. Look, look, you, you bring me an 18 year old young artist who's ambitious and who has a strong portfolio. You put him in art school. He will come out a wor- worse artist yes. and he will hate the West. Like, Absolutely. like it's, it's crazy with the blue hair and septum piercing and everything. <laughs> so, so I, I mean, it's, um, it's dark, man. It's dark. And, and, and it's, um, it's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, I look, and I went to art school. I went to GW, you know, it's <laughs> now, now when, when did you have, did you have, uh, like activist professors trying to make you into a little activist? Yeah, I, I was I was always causing causing a ruckus for very basic things. Like, there's nothing brave hard about it. I was just like, when are we gonna paint? Like, when are we gonna make art? 
Like I want to make beautiful things. Well, what, 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 what I'm saying is what were some of the things that the professors and the, the, the instructors there, like what were they trying to initiate you into and make you, make you an actor? Yeah. What, what was I'll, the I'll give you a crazy one. Well, okay. For example, there's a course called dark side of the mind. And in my head, I was like, oh, this class sounds fucking hardcore. Cool. So I look at it. I look at the professor, Professor Well. I'm like, okay, cool. And I'm thinking it's going to be like young. And it's like integrating the shadow in your work. And it's something cool, right? And I get in. And it's it's like the most, it's it's like who you'd expect, like, Ben Shapiro to be sitting across for like an Ownage video. It was about like, it was crazy. And, and it, it's like. Low-hanging fruit. <laughs> Low, low, low hanging fruit, but everyone there was just eating it up like, like, like seals. And I, I'll tell you what, actually, in a strange way, as a reaction, I did learn something. Not because the educators were respectable. I learned that there's this notion throughout our history of a dissident artist, the counterculture, the artist who pushes against the dominant narrative. They were telling me the dominant narrative is fuck white people, fuck God, fuck churches, fuck families, fuck traditional wholesome values. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, man, Jay, you're killing me. <laughs> That's what they're well, telling me. So, so I realized, yeah, go ahead. You know, in a way, like, okay, so the like G.K. Chesterton was right. He said there will come a time where orthodoxy will be the new counterculture. It's going to flip. And he's completely right about that. So I'm at a point now where it's like, 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 you know, think about it like this. If you wear a red MAGA hat and a Jesus chain walking down Lower East Side, they're going to treat you the same way they treated the punk rock kids wearing their black leather jackets with the metal spikes. They're going to throw soda cans on your feet. It's the same shit. Because you're going to, you can tell based on That's how why react, so. what we need instead of punk rock is Trump rock. Gonna be great. Gonna be wonderful. You're gonna get to your counterculture. I, I, I couldn't resist. Oh That's man, right. you gotta do the square. You're killing, do the square. Me. You're killing me, Jay. You're square. killing me. Do the square. It's gonna be wonderful. <laughs> um, this makes me think of so uh, my ex girlfriend like 13 years ago, right? Her sister was uh, in going into the gallery art world, and she was doing her. Uh, master's art project at Vanderbilt University, which has kind of a, a prominent art, whatever there for grad people. So um, I remember going to the show that she put on at Vanderbilt and it was like, like I was already, you know, tried conservative minded person at that time. And we go to this, this show and her main uh, piece was this giant box that you walk into. And when you walk in there, it was like, a circular kind of open hollowed out sphere in this giant wood box. And along the entire interior of the sphere was uh, like thousands of nails. So she had nailed everywhere except for like little spaces in between. And she might've had it lit up behind the space. I don't remember, but it was a, a very bizarre little, you know, nail box that you walked into. That's a, and then so, <laughs> you, her ex explanation of the meaning of the art was this is the womb of all of the women who have been told throughout history that they have to have children and so they're oppressed and so every nail represents a woman who didn't have ch the choice to have a baby or not but was forced to have a baby and it was like this giant yeah. pro uh, abrasion uh womb you're walking into a giant and it was and i'm like this is the dumbest stupidest most degenerate thing i've ever i've ever seen it's 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 it, it's so it's so sad man like like i mean it's it's two points to that one which is that um you know again a good artist in a way in a way a good artist is going to do anything like necessary for a wholesome culture that's underemphasized you should overemphasize it as a sort of correction Ideally, beautifully, which is why I paint biblical imagery and masculinity, because we're in such an irreverent time, right? So that's the first thing. Um, but the second thing is the very subject she's focusing on. It's so sad, man. Like, like, like I get some young men who hit me up and they're just like, they show me this red pill rage, right? And I can understand where they're coming from. I can empathize, right? Because I'm around their age, show I'm a younger guy too, and I can understand. But ultimately, these women have been so successfully brainwashed. It's on a, at a mass scale it's so fucking sad like because the art you're describing i've seen it everywhere man i've seen things like that everywhere i've seen i've seen this art again art basil and then there was a there was like a bunch of 
tampons stuff in like these different shaped boxes hanging and they call it installation art. Exactly. I'll tell you what, installation performance art, dog shit, usually. It's dog shit. It's like the ultimate way of making a gateway drug art, by the way, for some fucked up stuff. But it's so sad, man. This is the current state we're in. But th the worst thing well, is that like on top of that, I mean, to do Vanderbilt uh master's art program, I mean, plus the undergrad so she paid what probably two hundred fifty thousand dollars to learn how to hammer a bunch of nails into a giant box. I mean, uh, you know, you got ripped off. That's what happened right there. You got you got totally ripped off, and, and um, it's it's a shame, man. It's a shame because the artist is always reflecting the times that we are in. And I he, hope he, to even the bad art, right? Even the bad culture. corrupt art is still reflecting that, right? One hundred percent. I I mean, look. I, at the end of the day, it's. Uh, it's very telling that we'll use Marina Abramovich again. Marina Abramovich, she gets literal world tours at a snap of her fingers. She gets all the funding she ever wants to exhibit anywhere to normalize degeneracy and attack the cross. Did you ever Anytime see? Anytime she yeah. wants. Did you ever see? And, and guys like myself, <laughs> yeah. we claw and scratch now once we're out of the picture. It's crazy. Did you ever see the video where I did an impersonation of her? No, and, and I kind of don't want to if it's as dark as uh, what I've seen. No, it's not dark. Or do you just it's... stare at the camera glaringly? No, I, I did an avant-garde little art piece clip where I impersonate her. I'm pretty proud of it. So. Oh, man, I'm going to have to check that out later. I'm on, right yeah, now, it's, but, it's on my Instagram. But it might, it might turn me on. <laughs> I'm going to dig it back up. It's on my Instagram. Uh, Sam Hyde liked it, so I get the, oh, I get the Sam Hyde p uh, approval for that one. But, um, w, W. Yeah, I mean, it's just crazy that it's it's so it's like a mix of pure evil and pure scammery at a level that doesn't even seem possible because you would think that if it's that scammy, people would see through it. But no, they don't. It's and and, and it's a weird version of uh, the way that the artist or the actor or, or people are kind of conceived of in this sort of godlike way. And I think it's great to honor people that have actual talents but this is all uh anti-talent this is like anti anti-beauty anti-talent for the intentional purpose of what i think is a brutalization right there's a term that um one one author analyst of this called what was his term for something like the brutalization of the masses is what i think a lot or, or some people call it aesthetic terrorism have you ever heard that term that term yeah that sounds familiar i, I mean what i will say jay is that beauty um the very nature of beauty is, is it's it's christian and, and what i mean by that is that like what is in what makes something beautiful not to like sound like st thomas aquinas is that it, it has to you know a good work of art has the good the true or the beautiful and i guess what i'm saying is that like that, yeah. they can't they cannot help they cannot help but be ugly and I guess what I'm saying is that, like, it's a very important domain to understand that it's about taking it back. Like, it belongs to the good people. You know what I'm saying? So, like, be beauty is something that, like, it's a very effective tool. And it's also, you know, it it's, it's, will crystallize our values. And it's a form of seduction. And I think it's, we got to tap back into that because, man, we, we are, uh, we're, like, drowning when it comes to yeah like, did, did it, doesn't, you know, Nietzsche, doesn't Nietzsche have some quote like aesthetics will save the west or save civilization or something like that I, I kind of think that's true yeah though. yeah I mean the, the, the saying yeah. in philosophy is that beauty will save the world that's it yeah they always say that yeah beauty will save the world and, and you know um I've, I've studied the decline of societies as as you have as well and you know it's obviously there's Nietzsche the death of God the death of higher order boom gay science okay next thing female sexual liberation J.D. Unwin boom we're right there the next thing actually is Roger Scruton talking about how, you know, it's like the desecration of beauty and rewriting history and and being a becoming a, a civilization of ugliness. So we're kind of we're just about to get there. You know, we're between two and that, three. That's also <laughs> that's also why uh, the modeling world, the advertising world, uh, even the normie consumer world. Like when you go to the mall, dude, seriously, uh the mannequins are fat chicks now. I mean, what? They are. Half of the mannequins are gigantic fat chicks. What in the heck is going on? Well, that's because 
that's part of the inversion. You have to to have the equalization of all actions. Anything that's beautiful or higher or hierarchical, every and everything has to be equalized and brought down to some exact same mono sphere and the way that you globo mono culture basically the way you do that well, is and, that you, and, you know you know let me respond to that, that that's yeah. a really good point because like often um like i've done some talks about beauty you know uh because as something we should utilize so you and saying lizzo also, ain't beautiful yeah bigot. i mean lizzo, lizzo, you a lizzo, bigot. lizzo apparently lizzo is beautiful until you tell a woman she looks like lizzo but, um, <laughs> <laughs> exactly i mean i mean here's something i'll say about beauty is you just touch upon something important because often when I talk about beauty, I always notice that most men today, which goes to show you where we are in the culture, they get it confused with hotness. So when I use the word beauty, they think about ranking like the opposite sex on a one to 10 rating scale. You know what I'm saying? I use beauty and then they go like, oh, hot girl. And I'm like, when you look at the ancients, when you study even the church fathers, like when they talk about beauty, it's more close to the sacred. I think that's like a better word for it. So beauty should be looked upon analogous to the sacred. And when you understand what beauty is positionally, then things like physical attraction and all that, they kind of fall in the right place in, in, in its correct way. So I, 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 I'm a big believer in bringing back reverence and using beauty in that way as well, because we're in such an irreverent time. Who, who the reason why we are. Who that? Yeah. Who's who the reverence? You gonna bring him back? Who that? Oh man, it's, I, this guy's uh. I'm over here. I, I, I'm gonna stick with me. Lizzo. You <laughs> you could try to bring him back reverence. I'm gonna stick with Lizzo, baby. Oh man, I'm just joking. Um, bad yeah, jokes. Yeah, yeah. Bad jokes. Uh, we got a super bad, chat. Bad, bad jokes for days, man. You know, um, I was gonna say one too, but it's gonna bomb. So go it's ahead. Okay. <laughs> I actually like to bomb. Uh, there's, an art, <laughs> there's an art to bombing. So I don't know if you've mm -hmm. seen my, uh, you might actually not like my music because it seems like it might be a war on the beauty of music. It's called cringe core. You might've heard of it, but um, so Arthur's over here secretly warring against cringe core music, but we'll let it slide. AD says for $5, can you do an analysis of the film series, underworld especially the first three-part one you talking about the movie with kate beckinsale with vampires and werewolves come on man i mean maybe that sounds kind of ridiculous so maybe we could do analysis of that just because it's goofy but uh, uh maybe i don't know we'll see i actually enjoyed for these kind of movies we did analysis uh, for the super chatter if you're interested of blade that was actually a lot of fun because blade believe it or not really did have like bloodlines of the illuminati type stuff in it so if you haven't seen bl my blade yeah. analysis go watch that um but i think it's sim yeah. there's similar stuff in in kate beckinsale's underworld now your links are uh your link is in the show description i'll add your uh instagram uh, because i think they let you back on uh ig right you're back on there now. i'm back on for for now for now <laughs> yeah I'm the, I'm the most i'm it's crazy man like like i never thought like again I, i'm i'm a i'm a christian painter I never thought I'd be saying I'm like the most canceled fine artist. Like, it's so weird. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just trying to make Christ king. And it's like, apparently that's blasphemous to them. Well, hey, if people want to support you and your work, uh, do they go to your link there and, and can they buy directly from you? Or how does that work? Yeah, there's different ways to do it. If they go to my online shop, there it's more like prints and catalogs and postcards. But if they want to um, purchase original work of art, commission or original work, they have to fill out this form and it will set up a meeting. And then also, um, uh, last point, last uh, how, how much, if I want you to paint a giant, uh, Lizzo ass, will you do that or I, not? I mean, just because the struggle and the pain of it, I'm going to charge you a, a boatload. <laughs> All right. Hold on. Hold on. So, uh, so hold on. Is it, is it, are you charging me by the paint? So instead, could we, could I get you to paint Lizzo with a tiny ass and I'll get a discount? Oh man. I'm the, just the joking, dude. I, I don't, I don't want a Lizzo ass. I, I'm just joking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I know. You're, you're, you're out trolling me here, man. You're like, you're like. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I want to also add. I want to also add that, like, I, I can't get patronage in the traditional way anymore because I don't have a relationship with galleries. They want nothing to do with this nigga. <laughs> so, 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 what you can do is, um, um, you can go to support and. You know, you can become a, you know, I have to go from the collective patronage route, which allows me to continue to do what I do. So there's different ways to support me. But obviously, if you want original work, you know, hit me up. 
Awesome. Well, hey, man, thanks for coming on. It was a great conversation. Uh, we should yeah, have, this is awesome. We should, we should chat again in the future. Sorry for all the um, confusion and row bumps at the beginning, but everybody, if you would hit like and share, uh, leave a super chat. Go to chalk.com. That is the show sponsor. That is uh, the best supplements that you can get, period, out there in the world on the internet. Just like Arthur Kwan is the best artist out there, according to the internet. She legit right there. Too legit to quit. Mental focus, clarity. Use the promo code J50. That's J A Y Fab Zero to get fifty percent off. Get some of that Irish moss. Get some of that Tonkat Ali. These are the best adaptogens that you can get. And go read about them at the peer-reviewed studies that are over at chalk.com. That's C H O Q.com. The link is in the show description. Also, head on over to Rockfin and subscribe to Grand Theft World and my buddy Richard Grove, the best geopolitics podcast out there, bar none. Next to what we do over here, look for me on the fourth hour of Lord Voldemort. And tonight, guys, big debate with. Bryson Gray. Uh, hopefully, everybody can make what, it. What are you all debating, man? Well, Bryson has this uh, view. Uh, I don't exactly know what to call it. This sort of uh, version of, of what he calls Christianity that is this kind of messianic, anti-Trinitarian. Uh, he he follows the Torah. He thinks so. The debate is uh, oh, wow. who who actually follows the Torah. So. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna be. I, I wanted to give you. Okay, you just reminded me. I also wanted to give you kudos, man. Like you're one of the guys who are like calling out religious fraudery. I just wanted to also say, like, my man, that I appreciate that. Um, it's very important to keep uh keep the movement going, you know, proper. So, I want to also share that as well, man. Thanks, dude. Appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, uh, it kind of overlapped with uh, when we wrote when I wrote the Hollywood books. You know, I was reading about a lot of cults and stuff. And then, uh, you know, you, you notice the patterns of the way that people operate in cults that it, it's typically with a lot of these, uh, you know, online people. I'm not calling Bryson himself a cult leader. I think he's in an mm-hmm. ideological uh, cult like thing and which is, is a weird sectarian group. So, um, you know, he, when I did the debate last year in Nashville with uh, Tim, uh, Dave Gordon and uh, that, that Protestant pastor, I forget his name. Uh, Bryson came to the debate and was like arguing in the audience. And so we've been, we've been talking about doing a public debate since then. Uh, for a, well, for I'm going to tune in. I want you to do a KO. And after that, I want you to, uh, I want you to debate Sneeko. Cause I heard like your name was dropping that as well. Correct. Um, yes. Yeah. But he's, he's a Muslim. So it's going to be easy. Well, we got a bunch of, we got a bunch of Muslim debates coming up. So we got one with, uh, uh Daniel Hikikachu, uh, the, the well-known Muslim that's coming up in a few the weeks. The only problem with Muslims is, is you know, Takiya. They just like, you know, this hideaway. Yeah, they will so. do that. Yeah, they will do that. But <laughs> uh, we got a super chat from um, 40 Got the House on the Lake. Uh, you talking about that movie with uh, 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 Keanu Reeves where he's trying to date a chick in the past or something? House on the Lake. Uh, what is the book behind you? It's just a book that I thought looked cool. I got it from uh, my mom, I think, for Christmas. And it's just the ancient Greek philosophers. So people are like, why is that book on your shelf? Is it positioned there for some sort of symbolic significance? No, it's just a book on the shelf that looks cool, dude. That's it. <laughs> so, <laughs> people are always people are always trying to find these hidden meanings. Like Jamie found this. Of course. Jamie found this pineapple that she just stuck up there, and they're like, "Oh, you're secretly into uh, uh, you know wife swapping because that's what the pineapple means." It's like it's just a freaking oh, really? pineapple, dude. <laughs> like I didn't even know that. Like, oh, you're secretly you know <laughs> wife swapping because you have a pineapple. Okay, that's so sure. <laughs> yeah, everything is a secret code and symbol. It's not that way, man. It's just it's just a freaking pineapple. Thank you again, Arthur, for coming on. And uh, we'll chat again t- as soon, do another interview. Is that cool? Yeah, God bless you, Jay. And uh, thank you all for tuning in. We'll talk soon. Likewise.